welcome everyone to the Canadian Herpetological Society Herpetology, Herpetology Hangouts. My name is Pamela Rutherford. I'm an associate professor at Brandon University out in Manitoba, and I'm currently the president of CHS. Before we begin, I want to pay my respects to the Dakota, Anishinaabek, Oji Cree, Cree, Dene, and Métis people who were the first keepers of the land where I currently live. Today, we are meeting virtually, coast to coast to coast across Canada, and I would like to acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. As herpetologists, our natural lands and the animals within them are very important to us, and this recognition is a renewal of our commitment as a society to listening to and cherishing the traditional knowledge of the Indigenous people. I also want to welcome any international participants we have today and the experience and the heritage that they bring with them. So greetings everyone uh, to uh, joining us today, your ancestors, welcome to tonight's talk. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker this evening. Her name is Christina Ovaska. Christina has been co-chair of the Amphibian and Reptile Kosuic Subcommittee for a while. She's serving in her 11th year. So I think that puts her starting around 2010. She's also a research associate at the Royal British Columbia Museum, works with BioLink's environmental research consultant, and her research um, on amphibians and reptiles has taken her around the world. She's worked in British Columbia, she's worked in Western United States, Central America, and Ecuador. So I'm going to turn this over to Christina. She's going to give us uh, an overview talk, and then we will have a panel discussion and hopefully uh, other members from the um, subcommittee, including the other co-chair, Tom Herman, will join us for that panel discussion. All right, here we go. So um, in the past, uh, we've uh, often had our meeting together with uh, CHS uh, uh, in September during the annual meetings, but we haven't been able to do that for the past year. And uh, this year, our meeting is also going to be virtual as is the CHS annual meeting. So we thought this might be a good opportunity to get people together and uh, tell you a little bit about what we're doing with um, the Pacific Amphibians and Reptile Subcommittee. So uh, here is the outline. I'm just going to move things around here a little. Here we go. Um, uh, so uh, uh, first of all, uh, why are we doing uh, the assessments? Uh, a little bit about the importance of uh, assessments. Then I'd like to give you a brief overview of COSIVIC and the assessment process, including the Amphibians and Reptiles uh, Specialist Subcommittee and its functions. There are some spe special challenges in assessing amphibian reptile species. So just a little bit about that and uh, how you can help and participate. I'm hoping to keep this presentation uh, quite short, maybe 15 minutes or so, and uh, then have a panel discussion with uh, members, uh, with my other coach, Tom, who is there, and other members of the SSC uh, who are participating in this uh, event tonight. So let's see if I can advance my slide. Yes, importance of assessment. Uh, of course, it uh, provides priorities for protection, management, and stewardship activities. There are also legal implications to the Federal Species at Risk Act. Uh, recovery strategies and plans uh, have to be prepared for uh, threatened and endangered, threatened and special concern species, and uh, critical habitat designation for endangered and threatened. And last but not least is increased awareness by not only by the policymakers and resource managers, but also by uh, the general public and uh, uh, biologists uh, across the country. An example is the citizen science projects. iNaturalist is getting a, 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 a lot of uh, observations of species that have been listed by Kosivik. That makes them on the radar. And also 
poorly known groups and ecosystems get uh, publicity and uh, increased awareness uh, through this pro process. So Kostivik stands for the uh, Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, a bit of a mouthful, is an independent body of scientific, scientific experts that uh, their mandate is to assess the status of a Canadian species at risk. It's an uh, old organization. It was established in 1977, if you believe it or not. And the amphibian reptile subcommittee was uh, one of the first ones uh, uh, to, uh, to be functional. And Francis Cook was the first co-chair of uh, this committee. Kosivik was legally recognized under the Federal Species at Risk Act in 2003. It uh, consists um, of 46 members, and that uh, translates to 31 votes when we at the big table, uh, considering the status of species. That's because uh, uh, the co coaches, uh, they share a vote, so Tom and I will have to uh, <laughs> th th try to get the thing and get our votes in. That's not really true. We usually we agree on, most of the time we agree on what uh, the status should be. The members are from federal departments, provincial and territorial governments. They are also non-government scientists. And uh, then the co-chairs of the species specialist subcommittees of which they are 10 and also co-chairs of the Aboriginal Traditional Knowledge or ATK a subcommittee. We meet twice a year to assess the status of species. Here's, uh, this is from a couple of years ago when we could get together in a person. So there's quite a few people around the table. One important thing to know about CIVIC is the independence of the members. They don't represent governments or interest groups or industry or anyone else. Even if they've been sent there by the province, they can say whatever they want, vote however they vo want. You guys can get mad at me all you want, but this is for Eva. Oh. Uh, the evaluations are based on best available evidence, which includes uh, science and also ATK. And at this stage, we ignore social, economic, and political considerations. They come into play later on in, uh, uh, in the listing when uh, the government lists uh, species. Uh, that's when uh, they come into play. So we don't consider any of those is based on, uh, on uh, science and ATK. Civic assessments uh, form the basis for listing under SARA. Uh, so usually the listings, uh, they follow civic assessments, but uh, uh, not always. Some uh, species uh, uh, don't, that Kosivik has assessed, don't get listed. Examples are uh, some of the uh, commercially harvested fish. Schedule one is the official list of wildlife species at risk in Canada under SARA. And uh, here are the Kosivik status designations. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. So extinct, extirpated, and it's endangered, threatened, and special concern that are the species at risk. Then we also have a category not at risk and a data deficient, which is not is a category under Kosivik, but not under SARA. So it's a bit of a black hole. It's, it's not the same as not at risk. We try to avoid data deficient as much as we, we can. Sometimes uh, you have to put species there because they tend to be for, forgotten. There's really no recourse for getting the information to, uh, to get them assessed properly. Kosivik uh, uses uh, quantitative assessment criteria. So we assess all the species that uh, come to the table against these five criteria. 
they have um, uh, quantitative thresholds and uh, other requirements. They have sub criteria. Uh, I haven't shown them on this uh, slide, but we'll talk about a few of them later. So criteria, criterion A is a decline in total number of mature individuals. So you have to know something about the populations. And uh, actually, you have to know quite a bit about the populations to apply that cr criterion. Criterion B is small distribution range and decline or fluctuation. This is one that we quite often apply for herbs. C is small and declining number of mature individuals. D is a very small or restricted total Canadian population. And there's also E, the quantitative analysis, uh, uh, with, which is usually a population via viability analysis, and that's uh, rarely used. Endangered or threatened must fit into one of these above categories. So they must meet the quantitative criteria. We also have special concern. Uh, doesn't need, need to meet these criteria, but, uh, but uh, it may become endangered or threatened uh, based on vulnerability and threats. It's usually is threats that, we, uh, that are important in uh, getting uh, species special concern. Um, here, uh, the, the, the pause button doesn't seem to be there. So if you get dizzy, just uh, look away. But uh, criterion A is here we are on the road to ex extinction. Kosivik uh, doesn't really assess, these criteria don't assess status, they assess extinction risk. So we're all on this road. And criterion A is a rapid decline. Uh, often for widespread species, this is used, or if you have the information and you're trying to stop it before it goes to the extinction. So um, the next uh, stage here is the B and C criteria, which are uh, the restricted range of a small population that is declining. So we can catch them here at this speed bump. But if you don't catch them here, they continue on the road to extinction and we'll catch them hopefully at the D criterion, which is the very small population or very small range. And uh, if you don't catch them there, then we've lost the battle. So here's just a summary of uh, of the number of species that are listed at risk by Kosevik. This is current up to November 2019. This is from the annual Kosevik annual report. This is the most uh, up to date that is on the web. So there are 829 wildlife species that are listed at risk. And I should mention that wildlife species is somewhat different from species. It may be the entire species, but Kosevik also. Um, assesses uh, units that are below the species level. So there may be several wildlife species or you may have heard designatable units. We talk about DUs a lot, but they're the same as wildlife species under Sarah. Sarah gives us the option to assess uh, a, a species as several units based on uh, discreteness and significance. So uh, 829 species, uh, listed either endangered, threatened, or special concern. Reptiles, including turtles, include 49 uh, species and amphibians, 28. So uh, quite a few of the, of the total uh, number that we have in Canada. However, the biggest ones here you can see are the fishes, by far the majority and uh, also vascular plants. Uh, and if you wanna see the, what species have been listed, uh, this is uh, on the web uh, the, at the SARA uh, website. And the latest one is October, 2020, which is current up to November, 2019. So uh, we'll get to our amphibians and reptiles specialist subcommittee. Is uh, we one of 10 SSCs. 
there are currently 11 members in our subcommittee with expertise in various aspects of Canadian herpetofauna. We have members from coast to coast, but uh, no one from really up north, I don't believe. We, uh, this includes an early career uh, member, uh, which is a new uh, incentive or, uh, from COSIVIC uh, to include an early career member to each of the SSCs and also to the big table. We also have an uh, ATK, Abor Aboriginal Traditional Knowledge Rep, who is not part of the SSC, but attends our meetings and serves as a, a connection to ATK. Two coaches at the moment is uh, uh, Tom Herman and myself. We are, uh, the coaches are members of Civic and we re represent the SSC at the Civic's Wildlife Species Assessment Meetings which occur twice a year. Functions of the subcommittee is to establish the uh, prioritized candidate list of species per assessment. And this is public, uh, available for the public and uh, is uh, on the web. So we review this each year. We commission a review status reports on eligible species and we recommend status for the above species. We meet once a year in different parts of the country to discuss this. And we also have uh, virtual meetings every now and then to discuss uh, uh, items, issues that come up. So our function is to recommend the status using those criteria. Uh, and uh, then we take it to the big table where uh, there's a vote we present it and there's a discussion and then there's a, a vote of a two thirds majority for passing a status. So uh, here we are, we used to, to meet uh, from coast to coast and in the middle, this, here we are in Montreal a few years ago, but uh, the, our last meeting was virtual and it will be virtual again this uh, September. Most of our current work is uh, to do with reassessments. And you can blame uh, Ron Brooks and David Green for this, who were longtime coaches of this uh, subcommittee. And uh, they commissioned reports for uh, most Canadian amphibians and reptiles. So uh, now they're coming up for the 10 year reassessment that is uh, required under SARA. Actually, it's a review of classification is the official term under SARA. We may require a full new status report for uh, several reasons. If there's a significant amount of new information, it uh, might be appropriate to do a full report or if the status may have changed based on new information, new threats or a recovery. And there's also another reason why status may have changed, which is the COSIVIC's assess assessment cr criteria evolves constantly and we have new interpretations of the, the criteria, trying to follow IUCN as much as possible. Otherwise we can do a short report and there are many different forms and it's really hard to keep track of, uh, of those, which one is appropriate for which situation. And they are attached to the previous report. So we have a number of challenges with amphibians and reptiles. So this is the first uh, criterion A, which is the decline in total number of mature individuals. It makes no assumptions of population size and it can, uh, but it can catch these declining widespread species. And we see that in many birds, uh, wide, widespread uh, declines and formerly common species such as the barn swallow uh, uh, that are declining and uh, can be caught, so to speak, with this criteria, if you have the data. But for herbs, we very rarely have uh, sufficient historical baseline data. And we don't have data on population trends. We may have for a particular region or area, 
but uh, when you're talking about the entire range of a uh, Canadian range of the species, it's rare that we have good population trend data and can actually fit it in uh, these criteria. However, we have been able to, part of this uh, uh, criterion is future projections for declines. And we have been able to use this uh, quite effectively for uh, some of the large snakes that are uh, uh, susceptible to roadkill. So we've used the modeling approach, case studies, and it's really is the weight of evidence approach that has uh, helped us uh, uh, in, uh, in assessing uh, these species using the A criterion. A number of herbs have a small distribution uh, range uh, and are declining or fluctuating. And that's the criterion B, and that's traditionally one that a lot of the herbs have been assessed under. There's a concept that uh, in the criteria that uh, relies on severe fragmentation and a number of the species that were assessed previously as endangered or threatened uh, were severely fragmented and that was the key piece uh, required for this criterion to apply. What it means is 50% of the population must be in habitat fragments smaller than expected to support a viable population. So it's relatively easy to well, it's, nothing is easy, but uh, <laughs> comparably easy to get a handle on uh, the habitat fragments and their size. But then you also have to have the other piece, which is, uh, uh, are they likely to support a viable population? You can use threats and you can make inferences, but it's, it's a difficult and complex issue. And uh, the interpretation in, uh, I, Kosivik is much more stringent now than it was uh, 10 years ago. So we're running into this, this, I wouldn't say a problem, but a challenge how to assess these species. So here's one that we assessed just uh, last uh, April, the five line skink, the Carolinian population was uh, endangered because we were able to use the severe fragmentation. And uh, other one is extreme fluctuations. A, a lot of lot of terms have uh, a lot of English words have specific meanings when you're talking about civic criteria. So extreme fluctuations uh, in uh, civic speak are fluctuations of an order of magnitude in mature individuals over, over whatever time period. So we know that many amphibian populations fluctuate but how much and how synchronous are the fluctuations. Uh, so, uh, uh, so this is something that is also a key piece in the criterion B for species with small distribution ra range and a decline. So we use this uh, uh, successfully for the Great Basin Spadefoot, uh, which was uh, re reclassified, reassessed as threatened. And that was in our, I believe in our last uh, November meeting. And other, uh, other piece of evidence is uh, threats that may have changed and there's climate change. We've had a lot of discussion at Pacific on how to assess climate change. Uh, and there are a number of climate change vulnerability indices. One of them is an, uh, is a, uh, I, 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 maybe IUCN or NatureServe one, but it's a very, yeah, it's an IUCN one, it's a very uh, commonly used one. So we were able to get this analysis done for the Coeur d'Alene salamander. It's, it's based on exposure sensitivity and adaptab adaptability, but it involves uh, quite a bit of effort and GIS analysis. So this was the uh, main piece why the Cordelaine salamander stayed a special concern and we presented this species last April at the big table. So um, I'm coming to the conclusion of 
of my presentation here. And uh, I'd like to conclude with ways uh, you can all contribute to uh, this process. One is to write status reports. Uh, there's a bidding process for the full reports, uh, but we can do sole source for short format reports. Uh, we, we always looking for good report writers. That's really the key of getting a good report and getting the assessment uh, process running smoothly. So if there's an opportunity and you're interested in writing reports, uh, do, do bid when they come up. Or if you know there's a candidate species that a report will be prepared for, and it's a short report, uh, we have to do a better job in communicating what is coming up so we can uh, uh, we can gauge the interest of everyone. You can uh, be an observer at our annual meetings. So we love to have observers. And one of these days we'll start uh, meeting not virtually again. And these meetings, so we try to put them, uh, have them two days before the CHS meeting so that people can uh, attend both. You can apply for SSC membership. We have positions available uh, every year. Uh, if you do not get in the first time, uh, there's usually quite a bit of interest in being in the SSC. Uh, don't uh, get discouraged and give up. It's pers perseverance pays off. You can contribute data for upcoming assessments. We've had a, uh, we've had several people to do that and again the SSC has to be more uh, proactive in asking for the kind of information that is, is uh, would be useful and also uh, we welcome suggestions for candidate species. So that's all I have to say at this point so um, let's uh, Let's move on to the questions and you can ask questions about anything and everything. And hopefully my team will help answer them. So I'll stop sharing so I can see you all. I see a question in the, in the chat that came in earlier, uh, whether in the slide, whether uh, it reflected the total number of listed species or total number of assessed, and it was the total number of listed species. So over 800 species are listed at the moment. It's the only one we've got so far. Can I put a, a question, a general question out to the group? Cause we've got kind of a range of members who've served over time. Have things changed significantly? And I mean, you've talked about Think specifically fragmentation, but are there other changes that folks have seen? I don't know if this is something that uh, Steve or Sarah or Joe, folks that have served on the committee much longer than myself. Uh, yeah, does anybody, do you wanna, go ahead, Sarah. Um, I'd say that one thing that I noticed was the way that the threats calculator, I remember when I first started, the threats calculator was very vague and then it really developed. And those are really great heated conversations. <laughs> um, but to me, I think the threats calculator is something that's a really useful tool that um, gets you know, experts from across the country uh, to participate. And um, I think it helps keep us on task in a way that never happened when I remember being in the room with Ron. Um, so I, I'd say the threats calculator, I don't know if other people agree. I see Joe laughing. <laughs> so maybe he wants to contribute <laughs> to that. No, just, just your mention of Ron, that's all. <laughs> but yes, I agree with you. I think the threats calculator is, is changed over time and it's also provided, I, I remember, you know, even before the threats calculator, the threats descriptions and the threats sections, they were very kind of all over the place. Um, it was very hard to link those really qualitative descriptions to the criteria. And so I think what the threats calculator does is it really helps us um, better better link that to the criteria and and even how it's now incorporated in the reports the reports follow the same the the threat section and the, the subheadings follow the same um, format and headings as the threats calculator so there's 
much, much better cohesion now between between those. And I, I find that a huge help, especially with how much we're relying on the threats uh, now with the A criterion. That's been a huge change. Excellent. That, if I could yeah. just add to that, uh, the threats calculator is really an important component. It's becoming more and more important. It is one of the things that we are required by Sarah to consider and to identify. And, uh, and that, that process is still evolving. And there, we have a working group now on the threats calculator on how to improve it to make it uh, even uh, uh, less erratic uh, and, uh, and to remove some of the uh, oddities and idiosyncrasies that have, uh, have arisen and to uh, try to help uh, train people properly in how to, how to perform threats calculators. But uh, it is an increasingly important piece. So one other thing I might add to your, back to your question about what's changed. Um, the other thing that's changed is well, you can see from looking at the screen um, and that would, is the diversity on the committee. Uh, and uh, I, that's a very positive thing that's changed. I mean, I've been, been involved with the committee off and on over the past uh, more than 25 years. And, um, and the demography uh, and sex ratio looks very different now. And that's a good thing. And that's something that this committee has deliberately worked on um, uh, to try to uh, achieve. And I think we've, uh, we're getting there. Just a note. So it looks like we've got a few questions uh, coming into the chat. So first up from Julie Lia, can you, uh, can someone explain the difference between a full and a short format report? Do you wanna grab that one, Christina? Sure. Uh, full report is uh, what you usually think of as a Kosivik report. If you go and uh, uh, Google and download them, you see this uh, 30 to 120-page report, often not 30. So they're getting longer and longer. And it's quite a thorough report that uh, summarizes the biology of the species uh, in addition to uh, population trends and uh, other uh, aspects. The short form reports, um, uh, they, they kind of summaries what is new uh, and they tend to get longer too. And they said uh, there are many formats and we trying to try now a new process they called R rocks, which stands for Review of uh, what does this what does it stand for, Tom? Uh, review of R rapid review of classification. Right. Yeah. There you go. And uh, because it's not the process is not sustainable as it is. So we have over eight hundred species, and they rapidly coming up for reassessment plus the new ones. And it's just the, the workload is enormous; can't be kept up. So so those species that are not changing status, you can use these short formats, and they just. Uh, they just like short reports uh, of what is new and uh, justifying why the status has not changed. If status is, if we suspect the status uh, is changing up or down, then uh, we have to prepare for a report. Next question from Ying Chen. Was there a case that a controversy came up deciding whether one species should be put on the list? And if so, what do you usually do? Does anybody want to grab that one? Uh, Amanda, I don't know. Is that your wheelhouse? No? <laughs> I don't know if controversies are my wheelhouse. <laughs> Maybe the snapping turtle? Oh, OK. Was that a controversy? It was before my time. That was before so, my yeah, time so there's too. A candidate, you, you're talking about the candidate list. I don't quite understand the, exactly at what state in the process. Uh, I think it's a general question that says to, I, I, uh, I, I might be uh, misreading, so please correct me uh, if I've got this wrong, but uh, just a general question in terms of, of how we handle um, um, Differences in opinion on listing of species and, and the status, I guess. I think it's an arm wrestle usually, isn't it? No. Rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors, yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's the exact reason that this committee has as many people as it does and the, and the, the viewpoints that we all have. 
because by the time it's made it through the mill that is one of our discussions, um, it tends it tends to sort out um, with people deferring to points or um, you know understanding other people's perspectives. Um, and so I think I think almost every species has some disagreement. Everyone that I've been involved in certainly has. Um, um, but you know, eventually we usually settle down to something that keeps everybody mostly happy, mostly unhappy, and that's probably the best way to get to some of these things. Um, the one thing that that um, we do uh, do and um, is, is we use a precautionary principle. So um, when we function under the precautionary principle, it flips the burden of proof onto the non-conservation side. Um, so if there is uh, any evidence that would suggest that we uh, are seeing a threat, then we should assume we have a threat. Uh, and so sometimes that does weight the arguments one way or another. Yeah, it's a consensus-based process. So we often have, we have a lot of discussion and uh, looking at uh, the issue from uh, all sides. And that's why, yeah, it's nice to have a big committee and then we make our recommendation but that doesn't always stick because we make the case to the larger committee at the table at the annual meeting and there's a vote and it's a two-thirds majority vote for status and often we go to several votes and discussions between uh, each one to arrive to the two-thirds majority. Sometimes it's not what we recommend it. Sometimes it's not what we want it, but if you believe in the process, you just accept it. Uh, most of the time, our recommendations have been accepted. But, but it's very much an evidence-based approach. And it's a weight of evidence approach that, that we use on the subcommittee and also at the big table when we make decisions. Uh, similarly, when we're assessing which species to place priority to put bids out for, for new reports, we do the same thing. We put them through a process in which we assess the, the likelihood that they're at risk and, and, and we prioritize those. And, and ultimately, we, we almost always reach consensus. Uh, it's, it's pretty striking. I, I think a lot of people don't realize how rigorous this approach is. Uh, I would argue that this is probably the most rigorous species assessment process on the planet, uh, bar none. Uh, and uh, in terms of the rigor and the no number of people who see these draft reports in various stages and the feedback and the lack of politis politization uh, makes this, uh, it, it's really quite an admirable process. And it's really driven by the people you see on this screen. It's driven by the SSCs. They do all the work. Um, and uh, well, not all of it, but 90% of it. <laughs> and uh, uh, it really is quite a rigorous process. Uh, uh, thanks so much, Tom. That connects nicely to the next question. And I might put this one to you, Joe, if you're, if you're willing. It's uh, elaborating more on threat scores. And, and I know that you've participated in a lot of threats calls. So you've, a, a ton of experience. So uh, this comes from Diane or help. Can you describe in detail how the committee scores threats now? How do you gather and weigh the evidence? Is it a qualitative or quantitative approach? Would a more quantitative approach to threats calculators be welcome? So just kind of bundle up and speak to what you can. Yeah, I mean, I might actually defer to, to Chris because she's led a lot of these and, and she's a lot more familiar with them. Um, but I, I'll just say that it it is a very quantitative so so the call that we, we have a threats calculator call which where we try to loop in all the relevant experts from across the country and get them on the phone um, all at the same time which can be tricky and we have some really um, interesting and often sometimes uh, heated discussions but uh, incredibly informative and so we try to take that information and then the threats calculator is, is organized into sections and subsections for each threat and and we, we assign a specific number to the, the scope, the severity, and the timing of the threat. So in the end, based on our, our, on our discussions, we determine, you know, is the scope likely to, to impact less than 1% of the population, 1% or, you know, up to 10%, 10 to 30. And so we sort of assign ranges and numbers to these. And similarly with the, with the severity, um, 
we assess the likelihood. Well, again, maybe this is where I should defer to, to Christina, but um, we do kind of try to put numbers to it. So those numbers are only as good as the information and the assessments that come in. But in the end, we do come up with some numbers that allow us to assess the potential percent decline, range of percent decline that that threat might uh, result in. Yeah, anybody else want to add? Go ahead, Christina or Tom, if you've got uh, some additional comments. Well, that's a pretty good summary, Joe, of the of the process. Uh, it's still evolving, but it is it has a long way to go. Uh, because where those numbers come from, it's always dangerous to put numbers in if you don't have good evidence for it. And we just we have a COSIVIC uh, newly established um, subcommittee working group in COSIVIC that are looking at the threats calculator and how we can make it uh, more, have more basis for the quantification. For example, scope, uh, you can actually do a, a mapping exercise beforehand to make sure that you get the scope right. The severity, we assess the severity, which is the percentage population decline that you expect uh, from uh, the threat oper operating for the next 10 years. So we're looking into the future, which is also, uh, <laughs> which, uh, which is also uh, something that is difficult to do. We don't have a crystal ball. Uh, so we're looking into 10 years into the future, but we're just working on how to get, uh, how to, 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 to be more evidence-based and uh, more, uh, rationalize our decisions uh, more. Uh, so it's evolving, but it's better than uh, what it used to be. Anybody else got anything to add to that? I'll just, I'll just add that the one thing I love about the threats calculator is when you get the local knowledge. So, you know, I'm, I might be sitting on one coast of Canada, but we're assessing a species that's in a different area. And we try to find the researchers who are in that area working on that species and get those individuals to contribute. So this is where, um, you know, when, when Chris was saying how ways to get involved, it's really important if you're researching a species that you provide that information. But when Joe has mentioned about the heated debates, when you have a species you work on, you defend it to the T, but yet the, the timing scope or scale might actually be very small. <laughs> Even though to you, it's like the end of the world is happening for that species, AKA South Okanagan and, you know, other parts of British Columbia, but um, this is this is where uh, local knowledge and if and if the committee doesn't have the knowledge and if the people on the threats committee doesn't have the knowledge, we um, we take the time through many iterations to go to those people and and find the knowledge. And so I think it's about um, you know uh, making sure that information is always readily available because we can only use the evidence we have. Um, but sometimes it's a little bit of a chase. To find to find um, people to give you know expert knowledge on information, but I, I do love that like local knowledge that you get. Connie, have you got something to add? Yeah, please. Yeah, I was just thinking it. It I find it really helpful when we do have the actual data. Like if somebody's actually done a mapping exercise, um, or we have some um, population modeling or something that's been done, that that definitely makes the process a lot easier with the stress calculator. I think we're trying to do that a bit more, yeah, to, to quantify it. Excellent, thank you. Um, our next question is from Nikki Spensieri. Do citizen, I think citizen science program, sorry, help significantly with population as assessments? Is, is there anybody that's either been involved with citizen science programs or uh, I know we have a few people in the group that have written reports big ones and little ones, so dealt with data. Um, anybody uh, can, is there anybody that would be happy to talk about citizen science data, the role that they play in COSIRIC reports? Christina, do you wanna jump in to lead us off? Sure, well, um, iNaturalist records are quite often used in the assessments uh, for distribution and uh, uh, sometimes it's hard to verify what species uh, is actually uh, in that record, even if they uh, research quali qu quality, you still have to go through the process and find out whether they're valid, but they played a 
role in a number of our recent assessments, not so much for amphibians and reptiles, I don't think, but for certainly for some of the insect species and uh, birds. A birds, well, uh, birds. Is the yeah, I mean, bird. All the bird bird reports have the best quantitative data as a group of any of the. I think of any of the groups, and almost all of those data are based on citizen science, either breeding bird surveys, Christmas bird counts, and so forth. Uh, I naturalist um, and eBird. So uh, yeah, the bird, the citizen science programs are going to play an increasingly important role in future for I think for all the groups. And for the Ontario herb atlas, maybe you want to, Joe, you want to say something about. Yeah, I was just going to, going to mention that um, the, the Ontario Herp Atlas over the past 10 years has played a huge role in collecting a lot of um, occurrence data across the province and really updating our conservation data center, which is one of the, which is the primary source of distribution data that we use in COSIVIC reports, the um, data that we get from our conser provincial conservation data centers. So something I was going to mention was that a lot of these citizen science programs have been incredibly beneficial in terms of updating our occurrence data. Um, that we use in assessing distribution and, dis and change in distribution over time. Um, it's been extremely valuable. And, and the, herb out, the Ontario Herb Atlas is a good example because the, number of, the sheer number of records that came in through that, um, it, it doubled or quadrupled the, the number of records in our provincial CDC for reptiles and amphibians in the province um, in just that 10 year period. So hugely important, but where we tend to still not have a lot of data that we really need are data on trends. So we tend to get pretty good distribution data and, and at a pretty large scale. And over the long term, if we keep doing that for another 50 or 60 years, then that'll start to turn into trend data. But Tom was mentioning the Breeding Bird Atlas and the way that they collect and analyze the data, it allows them to get some very strong trend data, which is why all the birds are threatened now. Um, and, and we really suffer from a lack of trend data when we're trying to apply the A criterion. We're often having to rely on, on modeling and, and other sort of predictive approaches. Um, and so that's one thing I would mention is, is any citizen science work that is going to work on collecting data that will allow us to look at trends over time is extremely important for, for future assessments. And I could just add my perspective to that. There's, there's uh, the folks that are, that you're looking at now actually represent the uh, the geographic range, I think. We've got Tom out on, and Connie out on the East Coast. Uh, Gabrielle is our newest uh, student member joining us from Quebec. Nick and I are in the, in the prairies. Joe and Amanda are in Ontario. And Sarah works in British Columbia, but is in an undisclosed location in the United States. Just kidding. Anyway, um, so you just get huge variation. We have a, a citizen science program in Manitoba called the Manitoba Herp Atlas, but we don't have nearly the people that Ontario has, so we don't get nearly the records. So there are lots of challenges associated with that. Uh, a few more questions coming in. Sorry, I I'm, uh, I've, I'm, should be paying closer attention to the chat while I prattle on. Okay, uh, Ying Chen had a follow-up one. Do you weigh genetic and ecological data equally when assessing a species? Who would like to tackle that one? Nobody wants to tackle that one. <laughs> Go ahead, I can, Nick. Uh, I can yeah. try. There you go. Um, I, think, uh, I think it really depends on the question. Um, and the threats associated with uh, the organism. Um, sometimes if there's really major genetic differences, then, then it just shifts into um, different to use if there's actual geographic breaks as well. Um, and in, then if the, if the threats are to um, rare genetic backgrounds, then perhaps that might um, fall into a heavier weighting. Um, but most of the threats we see are ecological or human-based threats to an organism's ecology. Um, so although all are considered, uh, I would assume that usually it comes down to an ecological threat. And um, a lot of the things we're basing our decisions on are, stem from that. I don't know if there anyone else would agree or disagree with that statement, but um, I'd be happy to uh, listen to others. Thanks, Nick. Anybody else uh, want to jump in on that question? 
We took out a few more. Oh, we do have a few more in the chat. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, I mean, the genetic evidence is extremely important, particularly when we're assessing uh, DU structure. Uh, and that's absolutely essential then. And, uh, and that has an enormous impact on ultimately how the species is assessed and, and uh, at what level of risk. Uh, because uh, it, you know, whether you're dealing with one DU or two DUs or three DUs and so on. So uh, the genetic information uh, is, is really quite critical. Um, it's probably for many species, there's less genetic evidence available on population genetic structure than we would like. The more we have, the more we, I mean, we use a weight of evidence approach. So the more data we have, the more we can use. We've got a couple more questions in the chat. We're coming up on the hour, so I'll maybe just uh, work through these. And then we'll give you some contact information. If you do have any follow-up questions, you're more than help, uh, ha uh, welcome to connect with folks on the committee. So Julie had a follow-up question related to trend information. Is the need for trend information stated somewhere as in a document that we could refer to when writing grants, et cetera? I don't think so. I, I think that may be something we've actually talked about as a committee a couple, a few years ago, but having something along those lines, I, I remember a few years ago, we were chatting about it and I remember Jackie and I were talking about it. And I know from that, I ended up having a follow-up conversation with Ontario Nature and then they started a, a snake monitoring program. But I, I don't think that, that there's anything specifically we've sort of issued or published. And, and that, that's a good suggestion. It's something we might want to revisit. Um, okay. Could they refer to the like the operating and procedures manual manual because it does say like that you know it has the assessment criteria in there and I mean one of the criteria is the trend so just just that plain statement would be relevant maybe oh Tom you're muted or maybe you're not talking to Sorry. us yeah uh, the, the... The, the trends are also listed in the technical summary. There's a number of categories in the technical summary that deal explicitly with trends. So they are, you know, they're, they're very important. Excellent. Um, Thomas also had a good question. Uh, um, even when a species or DU is not put up for a bid, I understand that people can submit unsolicited reports. Uh, can the panel elaborate on this process if it exists? So this might be something for Chris or Tom. Co-chairs, what you can tell us about this process. Yeah, uh, there is a process for that and anyone can submit it, submit an unsolicited report. Um, I would, uh, and we have to, uh, we have to consider it. However, these reports are a lot of work uh, and uh, it would be good to contact us if you, uh, if you, before you prepare one so that uh, so that we can assess whether uh, we can give you some information on how to do it and uh, uh, whether we've had previous conversations about that particular species. Uh, we, the way of, uh, I can't recall now offhand in our committee whether there has been one recently or in the 11 years that I've been part of the committee, there's been talk about what there was someone did contact me and wanted to do one on the rough skin mute. Uh, and uh, that was some years ago, quite a few years ago, but it, uh, it never materialized. But we will consider any unsolicited reports, but do contact us. But sometimes these come from uh, CWS or from the province for uh, not to our SSC, but other SSCs have had that happen. Go ahead, Sarah. I'd like to make a shameless plug. Um, this is a good thing to branch to that um, when individuals are thinking about writing grants for master's students or research projects, it's great to look at the um, work that's being done at this level because we often have holes of information and we're always like, we really wish somebody could do this analysis or somebody could, you know, find this missing information or go back and get that kind of data, or these are the real problems we have. And um, that kind of like communication delay is really tough because, you know, you have like a year or so to do this report, but that doesn't involve you doing research. 
it's whatever evidence is available. And so I think if there's students or faculty or researchers at any level, it's always good to know what's needed in the species assessment process and contacting somebody from the SSC to figure out where the holes are. And I, I guarantee you, that's how I, I got grant money by saying, this is what is needed. Um, it works really well at getting grant money. So that's just like a little plug to say like, you know, yeah, reach out to the SSC for a lot of reasons for grants, because I think you'll find um, there's a long list of information that's missing. Excellent uh, suggestion. That does bring us to the end of the, the questions in the chat. Um, so firstly, I just a uh, huge thanks to Christina for taking time to put together the overview. And thanks to everybody on the panel for taking time to join in tonight. Um, as Christina mentioned, there's close integration between the SSC and CHS. Intentionally, the, the meetings are held uh, typically uh, in connection with the conference. And of course, all the members of the SSC are also CHS members. So if you would like to connect any folk, uh, connect with any folks with some follow-up questions, uh, please reach out to CHS through our various email channels. Um, or our Facebook page or through our YouTube channel. We've got lots of ways to get in touch with us and I'd be more than happy to, to connect you. Um, just following up on Sarah's excellent suggestion that uh, we have a really good sense of where knowledge gaps are that would be incredibly helpful in, uh, in conserving amphibians and reptiles, which is really what all of us are hoping to do. So. With that, uh, I will say good night to everybody. Thanks again, and we will see you all in a month.